All right, good evening. I'm gonna call this meeting to order our special workshop uh, with Alma Advisory Group. And uh, we are really happy to be able to start our initial planning session with uh, Monica Rosen, who is with uh, Alma Advisory Group. Um, to walk us through some of our um, options and timelines. So I'm going to pass it on over to you, uh, Monica, and welcome on the advisory group. Hi, everybody. Hi. Pleasure to see you all today. Um, okay, I think, uh, and Mike, you let me know how this works. Uh, should I share my screen? Um, you can do that. Otherwise, Jesse can forward if you want. Okay, perfect. I will share my screen and we will dive right in. So thank you everybody for having this time today. Um, we've got several big things that we wanna talk about. The first is we wanna discuss the shared purpose that the board wants to develop as a way of guiding our entire process. We wanna talk a little bit about the roles that support uh, the search. And the main and most important topic for this evening is the timeline. There are two different possible timelines for us to consider. One is taking a shorter term perspective and the other is taking a longer term perspective. So we wanna talk a little bit about the ins and outs of that. The last thing we wanna talk about is community engagement and just begin to get uh, your initial thoughts on that. Um, but if we don't get that far tonight, just having covered the purpose, roles and timeline will be good enough for where we are at this point in the search. So wanna put this up and I'm actually going to get out of slideshow mode because what I want you all to do is to take a look at the shared purpose as we've initially drafted it from the Alma team's perspective. So I'm just gonna give you a chance to look at this very quickly. So uh, I'll read it out loud for you all. Our goal is to recruit, screen, and select the next superintendent of Madison Metropolitan School District. Our purpose is to lead a transparent superintendent search process guided by the input of the Madison community and designed to mitigate bias every step of the way. And we really appreciate the opportunity when we're launching a search as important as this one to speak with the board essentially about what are your shared values your, that will serve as your guideposts, your compass throughout this process. Um, there will be times you'll be facing difficult decisions and you wanna come back to this to be able to say, are we acting with integrity to our shared purpose? And whenever we come together, we make sure that you're spending your time on our shared purpose. So this becomes a very important um, um, foundation for the work that you'll do together. Uh, and so we wanted to open it up to you all to just let's tease it apart. Let's think about the choice of words, what it is that you want to incorporate. I'll be taking notes right here. We may not get it fully refined tonight, uh, but uh, or we may, but if we don't, I want to make sure I capture the big ideas. And then when we come back together, I'll bring you what adjustments or adaptations um, we might make uh, to this statement. So I'll hand it over to you all for comments, questions, feedback, things that you want to make sure are incorporated in your shared purpose statement. And for the people in the room, if you wouldn't mind just, if you're in the room but not on the screen, if you wouldn't mind just saying your name so I know who's speaking, because uh, I can't see all the faces in the room. Is there a, a board member who would like to start with either um, for value that you would like to name and or any words, phrases, big ideas that you think are missing in this purpose statement?
Laura? Yes. Um, I guess a core value that is implied in this statement um, that I believe we share is honoring and uplifting diversity. Can you say that once more? Honoring and uplifting diversity. Thank you. Hi, this is um, Fabian speaking. And um, I think um, thinking about the process of this, I would say, you know, through our engagement with the community trying to develop goals for the role going forward too. Um, like, so, so hopefully this process can also uh, develop some common themes for goals we see in that engagement process. Please hands up. Can you see hands? Yeah. I'll wait. Sorry about that. No worries. Thanks, Chair. Um, I would say looking at what's missing from the statement for me, I think the, you know, the core of our work um, is educators and students, right? And so, and then I think the essence of our work is really about learning. Um, and so where are we making space for our own ability to learn and grow as we do this work? Um, where are we making space to prioritize and center students um, in the way that we do this work? Um, and, you know, how are we emphasizing the needs of our educators, but the overall needs of the folks that we employ as a district as we do this work? That's it for me. Or member Vandermulen. Yes, I just think we need something on the timeline even in there because we've got a lot of people who are at, who are very curious what we're doing timeline wise. And I think that needs to possibly even be in there because the community is wondering what are what are you doing? And I think it goes back to the transparency. Um board member Mozar Falcon. Thanks. Um, this is Blair. Um, I wonder about something like guided by the input and needs of the Madison community or the input and unique profiles of the Madison communities. Um, I, I think you know, one of the things that I'm hoping to see out of out of this process is um. I guess that's not the right way of saying it. Um, yeah, Madison's a unique city. All municipalities are their own sort of special thing. Um, and I hope that we can find a next superintendent who who's thinking about that. Right? It's really the right fit for the community. I hope that makes enough sense. Yeah, and I think they either the word needs or unique profiles, either one could potentially fit in there. Um, you did something interesting, which was you made communities plural. Is that on purpose? On purpose. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Board member Pearson. Oh, um, Dumbler. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's Maya. Um, I was going to say that the input of the greater Madison community is just because we do have families who are in Fitchburg, but technically in Madison per se. Um, 
So that'd be great to include them in there as well. Um, also like in collaboration with other folks, I think in some way at that, um, like I know that folks can be part of the Madison communities, but I guess fleshing it out a little more would be nice. Um, I'm not wedded to specific language on that, but. Um, Savian here. Um, one last thing I'd say is I'm trying to uh, incorporate the spirit of our framework in there um, and the goals in there. Um, yeah. Board chair, I want to give you an opportunity if there's anything. Um, here. My colleagues have named stuff. Um, I think the one thing I'm questioning is are we all thinking the same thing when we see mitigate bias every step of the way? Um, so I don't have a suggestion for how to replace that. <laughs> but I'm not sure that everybody would have the same interpretation on mitigating bias every step of the way. So is there something more specific that perhaps, um, Monica, you could, I don't know, describe in mitigating bias? Um. Well, can you give me an example of what you think two different interpretations of that might might be? I don't know, because we, we haven't had a conversation about what that looks like and how that would show up in a purpose statement. Okay. I don't um, think it's agreement. I just don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that we would all define that in the same way so is the design to mitigate bias every step of the way that's like more like the process right that we will undertake through the search um yeah um, it's basically designing a process uh that with each pass each step each approach is is has the intentionality behind it to mitigate bias. Um, so we'll, we're gonna talk through the timeline and activities in a moment. And when we get to that, I think I can explain a little bit more about how that's done. We can always come and revisit uh, to see if there's something that would feel more specific um, to that phrase once you we've talked through the process a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, Member Castro, were you going to say something? Yeah, um, I was just going to say, I think that there are different techniques process wise to have, you know, to mitigate bias, but I'll say from like a philosophical point, just an ability to, you know, see two, two truths at once. Say that again to see to what at once? Uh, uh, you know, two truths at once in terms of mitigating any potential bi biases we may have. Mm -hmm. That makes sense for sure. Um, it's also about recognizing that we each have our own biases and that those biases influence how we um, listen to and receive candidates um, and how we show up and listen to each other in this process. And we're constantly gonna have to be protecting against that. 
um, with some very specific, as you said, um, techniques um, and also facilitation that's helping us stay evidence-based, that's helping us acknowledge and name our biases when we have them um, and, and mentally continuously set them aside so that we can stay focused on the evidence that our candidates are providing. Um, so we're going to have a lot more conversation about those things, but I appreciate the comment that um, there are will be multiple truths um, because having different perspectives in the room and multiple people engaging with candidates is one of the ways that we mitigate bias because you can see the different interpretations or the different the different tru truths as board member Castro is saying and and be able to use all of that data to kind of get at what is the best decision for the group or the most the be most balanced view um, of a situation or of a person. So we'll have more time on that for sure. Um, you know, uh, board member Vandermeulen, one thing that's not here that I thought would be important um, yeah. is around ensuring that this is a process that is accessible to all members. I was, think, I was thinking that too. Okay, great. You beat me to it, but I was definitely strongly considering because people don't realize even making websites accessible so that they can be used by screen readers yeah. and those kind of things. People, I mean, it's not oftentimes done deliberately. It's just not always known. Well, I, I will just say, Monica, I really appreciated you um, just elaborating a little bit more about the process, the processes um, of mitigating bias. And I really liked what you said around our own recognition um, of our biases that we all have. And, um, and so I, I wonder if, I guess for me, if there might be a core value around um, coming in with self-awareness um, and the ability to be reflective um, might be one of the things that would be a good guiding value for me anyway. I like that. And I see a um, connection to board member Muldrow's comment earlier too, about just coming in as learners in yeah. this process. So I want to play with that a little bit and see how do we reflect that in here um, and come back to you. But I, I really do love the, the aspect of self-reflection, self-awareness, learning, um, you know, engaging as learners in this process. Um, I'm also hearing the need to bring in, um, you know, the, um, the core focus on your students being centered and prioritizing center and prioritize students in the way you do this work. Um, so I'll be able to come back to this, um, make, do a little work with this and, and come back to you with adjustments that reflect all of your comments. Um, just want to make sure there isn't anything we've missed or that hasn't been said yet that the group should consider. Okay, so with your permission, board chair, I'll move on to our next conversation. Sounds good. Excellent. So we're going to talk about roles in this process, and I want to share a little bit about the role of the search firm versus the board and the role of your board liaisons, and then allow the group to have a conversation about this. Um, so first, I just wanna share that uh, as we see our scope, Alma Advisory Group as your search firm is primarily in charge of design and execution of a successful search, where the board of education is really setting the direction, uh, guiding our work, and supporting and sponsoring the success of the work. Well, the, what that looks like is that, you know, we're the Alma team is really engaging the community and the board to clarify the top skills needed for the role, 
clearly we're recruiting strong, uh, diverse talent uh, for the role, uh, but we're also responsible for designing an equitable, transparent, and rigorous hiring process. Um, we're le uh, leading the relationship with the candidates and engaging the candidates um, from everything from convincing people to apply all the way through the interview process and ensuring that we understand their expectations right from the start um, uh, and, and really in many ways kind of serving as a helpful liaison with your chosen candidate at the point of contract negotiation. Obviously, the board leads its own contract negotiation, but we can be really helpful in understanding what your top candidates' um, expectations are in terms of salary or anything else that they might seek to negotiate for so that the board can put its best foot forward in that process. Um, we are facilitating with the board. We're your partners throughout this um, entire process, uh, but really helping to facilitate your training in this process, your, your reflection in this process, and ultimately your final decision making. We Part of our scope, very intentionally so, is that after the decision is made, that we gather together at least one more time to talk about induction and transition planning and how to take the insight from the process to inform um, the supports you wanna put in place for your next superintendent. So the board's role here is really heavy in ensuring that Alma is reaching all of the communities uh, as Blair was sharing that are part of Madison. So we really look to the board and to the staff as well to help identify well-represented groups of stakeholders to engage how we can reach out to different communities to make sure that everyone is aware of the opportunities uh, to participate in the process, to ensure that this is an, an accessible process um, to all participants, you know, uh, ensure that the facilities we're meeting in are accessible, that, uh, you know, as board member Vandermulen was just sharing, that we have the appropriate translation, sign language, um, printed word, uh, whatever um, tools and um, resources available so that everybody has the same opportunity to participate. Um, if there's ever a media issue or question, typically it's the board that's responding. Uh, so we would work with the board and your communications um, team to handle any questions, but also we wanna make sure the board is clearly seen and represented as the drivers of this process and the owners of this process, because you are. Um, and finally, we expect all board members to actively participate in every part of the design process, in the interview process, and in the final selection uh, decision. Um, so for the Alma team, we get nervous when some members are opting in and out. We see this decision as the most important decision a board has to make. Um, and we want every voice engaged at every step. We don't wanna get to the end of the process and be, realize we missed somebody or we missed an important perspective along the way. Um, our goal is that you have a candidate that everyone on the board can unanimously get behind. That's Alma's goal. Um, so it's not a requirement, but we're constantly looking for your alignment and supporting your alignment along the way because of that. I'm gonna talk quickly about the role of board liaisons and then would love to just have discussion with the group about what, what I'm sharing here. So uh, Alma usually requests uh, typically two board member liaisons. Uh, sometimes they're called search committee chairs or search chairs or liaisons is perfectly, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. The idea is that there are two board members that are working with the Alma team in between uh, and through in between board meetings and throughout the search process. The role of the liaisons is very specific. Um, you are representing the full board when the board is not meeting. Um, they're directing the search firm to ensure that we're meeting the full board's expectations. So they're providing feedback. If there are any concerns, anything that 
feels like it's not aligned with the agreements that we've made, um, or if there are new needs that have come up that hadn't been anticipated that we need to build into our work together, um, your liaisons may be the ones to provide that feedback to us. Um, there may be some key decisions needed between board meetings. These are typically tactical in nature. Um, for example, we might realize there's a shift in a certain meeting availability, or um, we might need additional help identifying stakeholders to reach out to, um, and it happens to be between board meetings that your liaisons would be able to troubleshoot and solve with us on those key issues so that we can keep moving forward. In order to do that then, the liaisons are really accountable to ensure the full board understands any key decisions that have been made outside of board meetings. Um, and so that responsibility of ensuring all of you are informed um, lay, lies with the liaisons. Um, so that's the key summary here. I'd love to turn it over to the board chair first um, because we have had some discussion about who the board liaisons might be, um, but really want to get this full board's um, input on this. Uh, so would like, like to start with you, Chair, and then we can talk about both the role of board firm and liaisons. Sure. Um, so my board colleagues, you'll know that when we had our board retreat um, a couple of Fridays ago, um, I, I was able to provide you just a short update on an initial meeting with Monica and Alma Group about kind of this next step. Um, in thinking about how we might be able to move forward with these board liaison roles, I have <laughs> proposed um, to Monica that Ali play one of those roles because she's been on the board, has been through a search before, and I think is in pretty good relationship and communication with every single board member um, and would do a really nice job of representing um, any issues that might arise. Um, and then I was proposing that I also play one of those roles um, just because in the board president or chair role, um, it seems like it would be helpful to also be in the loop. Um, so that's, that's just been since the last board retreat. Um, but if there are some other thoughts on how to best represent the board in these liaison roles, I'd love to hear it. Uh, board member Vandermuller. Um, heavy, I respect that. And I think you guys will do fine. It's just um, having done, uh, you know, three searches so far, I just, if you need any help, I would be glad to because I'm, been able to do as many searches and been on board. Yes, and that was not to um, exclude your- No, I know that. As well. No, I'm just offering help. I, I appreciate that. And I think Monica can also um, maybe in a little bit talk about how each board member is going to yeah. have direct access to her. Um, you know, everybody's gonna play a really critical role in this search. This is. These are just the two people who are picking up an extra meeting to make sure that we're like moving things forward um, with Alma Advisory Group and, and uh, Mike Herding. Any other thoughts that we should discuss on the board liaison roles? Just see if I can. Uh, board Member Simkin. Yeah, I'll just say thank you both for stepping up and volunteering to take on yet another responsibility. I really appreciate that. Appreciate that. Board member Castro. Yes, thank you um, both for um, volunteering, stepping up for that role. Uh, my other question is, um, will there be kind of a, um, a source or uh, portal where board members can access paperwork and documents and uh, shared artifacts like that? That's an excellent question. We will create a shared space uh, for the board um, for anything that's important for you to refer to throughout the process. So um, as needed, um, we'll be able to provide that for everybody. 
Yes. And um, as the board chair shared, um, you know, for each of you, we're going to one of our early steps will be to have one on one conversations with each board member. Um, you will each have my personal cell phone and really want to have a very open door uh, relationship with each board member that you know at any point in time you can reach out if anything's coming up you want me to be aware of you have a question or concern uh, that I will jump on the phone with you at a moment's notice so you will always have that um, and uh, and uh, the board chair and board member Muldrow are very committed to ensuring uh, that everyone is aware of any important decisions that are made or any even minor things that um, that we have to come up with throughout. But really, this this truly is a tactical um, relationship or work that we're doing here between the meetings where the big uh, design decisions are happening with all of you. And I agree, typically your the board colleagues are thankful for the two that are willing <laughs> to take on the extra meeting time and work. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to go back, uh, well, I want uh, welcome additional comments on the board liaison and also wanted to go back to the conversation about the role of the search firm versus the role of the board, just to make sure there aren't any questions there. Um, board member Mosner Welcome. Thanks. Um, I have a question about the recruiting tool and if, um, like, uh, if, if it's specific to, to Madison, um, I'm thinking in particular of the Multicultural Student Achievement Network, MSAN, um, which, you know, includes like tons of school districts with superintendents from all over the nation. Um, if, if you're like, practices to, to tap into your own networks, but also networks that might, um, that you might not choose to use in a different city. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So the Alma team is already researching the best places to, to post and advertise the position and a big part of it are unique organizations like the one that you just mentioned. Um, so we will come with a proposed list for you all to react to and provide feedback and welcome any ideas anybody has on where to help get the word out. Um, we want to cast as wide a net as possible for sure. Board member Vandermeulen. Yes, um, can we, can the board suggest candidates, for example? Or is that solely uh, Alma thing? I don't want to step on anyone's toes. No, I appreciate that. So you may be contacted by people interested in the role. You may know of people that you think we should go out and find and bring to the district. We want all of those ideas. So for sure, if board members have thoughts on people you've seen, met, know who you think would be impressive that we should um, reach out to, we want to do that. We would prefer Alma is doing that outreach and not the board. So we would like you to give us those names and let us go do that work for you. You may have individuals reach out to you and say they're interested, or you may have individuals you want to connect us with, and that's okay. We would want you to refer them directly to the search firm, get them in our hands as fast as possible, and then we'll take the contact from there. Um, Sometimes um, board members will go ahead and have exploratory conversations with candidates. Um, you know, it's better if Alma does that for you. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, so we would ask if, if anyone expresses an interest, you just as quickly as you can say, here's Monica, she'd love to talk to you or have her team speak with you about the opportunity and let us take it from there. We will be sharing with you all when we get to the point that we're posting the position, uh, wording for your social media, for your email groups, whatever you're on, uh, so that you can share the information with your net with each of your networks as well. <clears throat> Great. Any other comments or questions? All right. 
board chair permission to move on to our next topic here. Okay. Please. So our next topic is on our search timeline. So there are a few things that I want to say before I show you this. Um, so let me just move up to this. Um, so there is a decision we need to make now that the board has appointed an interim as to whether you want to move oh, swiftly. Sorry. Oh, did someone say something? Never mind. Okay, so there's a, a now that you've appointed an interim uh, superintendent, there's a decision to be made as to whether you want to move swiftly to fill the role, um, and essentially take a four to six month time timeline here, or whether you want to provide for your for the for the district the entire, you know, up to next end of next school year um, to fill the role. And I wanted to show what those two timelines might look like and then provide for you my perspective on some of the considerations, reasons why you would choose one way over another. So the first option here is our shorter term timeline. We would work to begin recruiting immediately. We're already recruiting, so let's set that aside. But we would recruiting would begin immediately in the month of May. Um, our focus in the month of May is to confirm our overall plan. Um, we would be looking at any convenings that we want to take place and plan for those as swiftly as possible. Um, and uh, June then really becomes the core time for stakeholder input. So it typically takes at least four weeks to get um, meetings advertised, make sure all members of the community are aware of the opportunities to engage with the Alma team. Uh, so we'd be doing a lot of that in, in the month of June. Because we're moving quickly, we may need to have the posting advertised while uh, we're engaging with the community, which we've had different districts do this. It can work both ways. Uh, the community feedback can be used to refine the position after it's posted, that's totally fine. And the community input informs all stages of the screening, recruitment and screening. Um, but you would likely have to post the position before your stakeholder input is completed. We would look to finalize the job profile uh, probably in early June and get it posted. Uh, and we would expect the month of July to be our prime recruitment and screening window. So we would expect to begin interviewing in July and moving most likely to a semi-finalist uh, round in August. You might get as far as a finalist round in August, but most likely the goal would be that by September, you'd be able to announce uh, your next uh, superintendent. Now, hard for us to know how soon your candidate would be able to start. Your timing would be bumping right up against or, or going beyond the start of the next school year. So more likely than not, your candidate would probably need some months to transition out of their organization. So more likely you're looking at a January start. Um, but it's possible you could have someone start sooner. Uh, a few considerations with this timeline. The main one is stakeholder engagement. Um, so engaging community, broader community is less of an issue, parents and families, but engaging your staff is very difficult at the end of the school year um, and in the summer months for school-based staff. Uh, so there's a concern here about how best to handle stakeholder engagement in this timeline. Um, the other thing that's a consideration is that uh, you would be announcing somewhere right at the start of the school year and or engaging in finalist interviews at the start of the school year. Um, so the pieces that involve your stakeholders are happening at, happening at inopportune times. Now you could slightly lengthen this time frame if you wanted, but I wanted I wanted to lay that out for you. Why you would choose this timeline from my perspective is if the district is really in need of your next uh, uh, permanent leader um, as quickly as possible. 
So if it feels like there's a true need for us to know who the superintendent is going to be, that there's a sense of unsettledness in the community or among staff that will be supported by knowing that the board is working with urgency as expeditiously as possible to fill this role by this fall, um, then it's really about your sense of urgency that would have you choose yes. this particular timeline. I wanna move on and share what a longer option would look like um, from our vantage point. A longer term would essentially be th thinking and organizing around this idea that your next leader would be able to start uh, around the end or just after the end of the next school year. So what we would likely do is we would engage in the summer for planning of your work, but your core stakeholder activity would begin after the next school year is fully settled and in place. Now, can we start community engagement before then? Absolutely. There's nothing stopping us, but the peak of our community convenings, meeting with staff to get their perspective, sitting down with your students, your, com your community partners and organizations, we would likely um, do those after the school year starts. So maybe like sometime in September or October. Um, we likely wouldn't, uh, we would wait for that community engagement to be complete with the thought that we would be launching the job uh, profile, finalizing the job profile, and launching the official um, search probably sometime in October. Um, and then now you're kind of in a more typical early uh, superintendent search process, which is looking more October to March for your key recruitment and screening window. We would spend October through December. Um, and into January in our prime candidate recruitment window and initial screening window. The thought is that uh, February becomes the time when the board is engaging in earnest with candidates. We might get to some, we would expect to be in at least semi-finalist stage, if not finalist stage in February. The hope would be that by March, the board would uh, be able to make its final selection of your next uh, superintendent. Again, more likely than not, with the March selection, your candidate's probably starting in July 1, but it is possible candidate might start uh, you know, sometime in April or May, may be able to start sooner. We typically have uh, candidates that are either in chief level roles or in sitting superintendent roles. So their transition timeline is always a little bit tricky. Um, however, what happens with this timeline is, again, your stakeholder engagement, you have a lot more time to plan for it. Um, and uh, you're able to carry it out at a time when people are back in schools and you're past the most, what can be the more hectic, busy times of the year. Uh, so we think that it's more favorable for stakeholder engagement. The other thing is you're able to work with candidates who are able to consider a role. So we believe the candidate pool will be tighter right now because most leaders have made their commitments for the next school year to their organizations. Um, that said, the current job market has been very unique. So we won't know till we post. Um, it is possible there'll be high interest, but when you're looking and thinking a school year ahead, we can now talk to potentially sitting superintendents who can think about that kind of runway for planning for transition for themselves. Um, and people can be thinking enough ahead, even at the chief level roles, uh, that they may be more likely to engage with us in a process. Uh, confidentiality is also always really critical for candidates. Um, but, uh, you know, I think you'll have a stronger candidate pool if you lengthen your process. Uh, from Alma's standpoint, we, you know, obviously it's a longer term engagement, but we're planning for our time and effort at those key moments in time. So, you know, for us, we're, you know, lighter touch 
in the summer more about planning and then very heavy in October through March, um, which, which we would expect to be kind of the heart of the search timing. So this is a process you should do if you're feeling that uh, a longer time frame if, uh, may give you better can, uh, stakeholder engagement. If you're feeling that your current interim is able to stay through the end of the school year and can support any sort of stability or strengthening of the organization, um, potentially readying the organization for your next leader. Um, so to the extent there's a high degree of comfort with your interim, a willingness on her part to, to be able to stay with you through the next school year, um, you can have a little bit more of this kind of a pace in the process. Um, it also allows your staff to kind of understand what to expect over the next year, um, which will either be comforting or frustrating. So you you all let us know um, what you think your, your um, staff in particular would be more comfortable with. Um, so, but that said, welcome any comments, questions. Yes, board member Castro. I, oh, sorry. Board actually, board member um, Vandermeulen was um, first, and then we'll go to board member Castro. No problem. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Oh, good. Um, I would argue for uh, the fast track. The reason I argue for the fast track is for our staff have been pretty open that they, after watching last time, they were very nervous over whether their jobs were going to be cut, what changes were going to be done, and a lot of anxiety. One. Number two, although we went to referendum at the same time, last time when we didn't do fast track, uh, the superintendent search, it was incredibly fatiguing for everyone to try and work on the referendum and the superintendent search all, in, all at once. And I think that could be problematic. So it's for those two reasons. I, I really think, one, we need to go local uh, and as local as we can on the candidates. And number two, I think we do need the fast track for those reasons. But as I said, I have one voice. I'm willing to hear everyone else's. Thank you for um, getting this round going. Uh, board Member Castro and then Board Member Pearson. Thank you, yeah. Um, you know, there, there, there is a desire for me to try and um, um, but when I think you know, do do like we could have a potential longer process, but you know, if we get good bites this summer. But when I was thinking through the logistics during the presentation and stuff, um, I, I do lean towards having a more long-term, methodical community engagement process. Um, I feel like we can have just a much better process if um, we really think through it this summer, and then um have a more robust process as the school year starts next next year and then um yeah i and it on a similar note i do agree that um we have a lot on our on, on our on our plate regarding the budget and the referendum but we've got to start planning the referendum you know this summer and so we would be putting a lot of pressure on ourselves and the community this summer um and so um, taking our time with some of these big decisions is uh, kind of where I land. And so um, I, I, I was just really intrigued by the opportunity of having a more methodical, more methodical community engagement process throughout the school year. Thank you. Board Member Pearson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also hold um, similar links that Savian mentioned just earlier. I was also thinking of possibly doing it on the faster timeline so that we could um, get more stability in our schools sooner. Um, however, I do think there is um, a lot of value in having the, the longer timeline, one, to engage um, all stakeholders in a, a more um, concentrated effort and not, and not have it so rushed. Um, I think... You know the confidence of from the staff um, in us. I think 
partially is going to be us really taking our time and really trying to find the best candidate. Um, and from my understanding is that, um, and what Monica has already alluded to, is that it allows us to have a more robust candidate pool um, and uh, the longer timeline. Um, and it gives whoever we decide to bring on the space and flexibility to do what they need to do to transition, whether they are local here in Madison or they come from somewhere else. Um, so I am leaning towards more of the, the longer, um, the second option, um, which is the, the longer period of time. Um, and I do think that we can do both. Um, and I think it would, um, hopefully folks would have the confidence in the board too, that we're really um, focusing on both of these, these issues, superintendent and referendum, but we're also giving both of them the amount of time, energy, and thoughtfulness uh, for both of the processes. So I lean towards more of the longer time frame. Thank you. Board Member Simkin. I really appreciated the points that Board Member Vandermullen brought forward around balancing the two really big lifts at the same time um, and making sure that our staff are feeling secure and stable. Um, at the same time, I'm really interested in this process leading us towards somebody who is going to be hopefully long-term. And to do that, I think that our best option is to have a very wide candidate pool. And so because of that in particular, um, I am in favor of the longer timeline. Uh, board member Mosner Feltham. Thank you. Um, I think I would add two points to the why longer um, that I haven't heard yet. Um, one is that I actually think that the, and forgive me if I'm misunderstanding because I have not been on the board for a referendum before, but I would think that like part of a referendum and part of a developing <laughs> the vision for a superintendent or the um, sort of like you had a really good word for it, Monica, the profile or, or, or whatever, like that, those are both ways of articulating with our communities, with our vision for Madison schools in the future. And so I think that those could actually really complement each other. And the other thing is in terms of stability for staff. One of the things that happens that you might not like be, you might not know, is like in a school building in an interim superintendent year, this, the, the stability is actually already in the schools, right? Like when school-based leadership teams are working together to say, okay, how are we gonna proceed through this year without a district level vision of you know, the future? And one of the outcomes of that is um, better staff engagement because you have a little bit more space to think about, okay, here we all are at this neighborhood school. What do we see as like the way this year is gonna go? Um, and I think that, um, that's actually a really nice way of helping people develop some of those, what they want to say in that input. And so, so I feel like that, that will be good. Um, and, I, and I have confidence in our group too. Thank you. Board Member Muldrow. Thanks, Board President Nichols. I just want to chime in and say, um, I greatly appreciate the comments of, of other board members. I do think like there, there is a need to talk about the importance of next year and what the leadership we have means for next year. And I feel like there's a lot of stability in the interim we've selected. So I want to say that I'm really confident <laughs> 
in in Lisa Kufstead's leadership. Um, I'm really grateful that she has agreed via her contract to stay on for the entirety of, you know, because the last time we had this conversation, we didn't know if we had somebody who was willing um, to to be our interim over the course of the entirety of next year. And now we do. Um, and I think that that creates a lot of relief. And I also think that there's the opportunity with somebody who has, you know, she spent her career in this district and has a really thorough understanding of MMSD and of our community um, to bring a lot of strength um, and a lot of stability to her leadership and also, you know, is working closely with folks who were, were here during our last referendum. So Mike Herding, as somebody who's going to be engaged in this search, was also somebody who was tremendously um important in our ability to pass our, our last referendums. So I do think that we we have the stability in the, the interim leadership that's been still selected to take our time. My one question would be is I'm like, I think like timelines in some ways are aspirational. Um, and I want to acknowledge that we had a very similar timeline in our last search. And what happened in that last search is that the search that was supposed to end in March actually failed. Um, and COVID happened. It was 2020. Like, I don't want to say we're in the same predicament, but I do want to ask Monica, were we in that situation where we made an offer and somebody was not actually interested in transitioning or able to transition for whatever reason? What happens then? And what does our timeline look like after that? Yeah, um, so I think it's a great question, and there are a few things. First of all, Alma never stops recruiting candidates, so we're always cultivating candidates. For us, it's not final until your candidate signs on the dotted line. The goal for us is to have three strong finalists, that any one of them, the board feels confident, are viable, and that they would vote for and feel comfortable, uh, you know, as their next superintendent. Uh, now, do people drop out? Yes, people do drop out. But the hope is that we get to the point at the finalist stage where you have more than one really strong option. Um, now, I, my understanding is you're, in your situation, you had an accepted offer who oh. then reneged, right? And that's a little different because once you have an accepted offer and you've announced your person, it's, it, it's a little more challenging to go back to other candidates who... Now, no, they were not the first choice, um, but certainly the next step would likely be to go to your other finalists. Um, uh, I think in a timeline like February or March, you're still early enough in the hiring cycle that the candidate pool is still very strong. Um, we would hope you would not have a failed search and have to restart. Uh, we would expect that you've got candidates still in the pipeline that are up available for consideration, um, but you might have to do another round of interviews, another round of finalists, another selection. My hope would be that your candidate pool is so strong and you've already engaged with enough strong candidates that there are people you can just move forward rather than starting over. But again, you will probably are still looking at a start time around the same. I think you should be you know, predicting a July 1 <laughs> just because that's how the school year cycle tends to run and you'd still be in with enough time uh, to, to be able to fill the role before then. Thank you so much for speaking to that. For me, that makes a huge difference in terms of uh, what our timeline looks like, because what I think I have concern about is if we take our time and don't necessarily cultivate the interest or the candidate we're looking for, we still need to have options um, moving towards July 1st. And so I, I appreciate uh the, the succinctness with, for which you explain that. Um, and the fact that you're honest about, you know, people do drop out, people who are in these pools are looking at multiple opportunities. Um, and you might find somebody who's great and they might find a district that's a little bit of a better fit. So everybody is exploring options in this process. And I think our, our timeline um, needs to be in the interests of, of the greater Madison community and, and, you know, ensure that we're finding the right superintendent for our district. Um, so thank you for, for speaking to that. And with that being said, um, I want to thank board member Vandermeulen for your remarks in terms of 
why we might want to expedite this process. And I want to agree with uh, the board members who have said you're a little bit more interested in us having, you know, a, a more expansive relationship with the community and engaging in a more thorough search um, and really hoping to cultivate, you know, a lot of options and really good options. Yeah, and I'll just add myself to the queue. I think based on, um, there's a couple of factors of why I'm also leaning more for the second option, which is the longer timeline. Um, one is I feel like we as a board, what I've heard us say is that we really do want a transparent, accessible, equitable community engagement process. And the fact that we play a role in that, like we have to help identify well-represented groups, we have to ensure that there's appropriate outreach, like we play that role in the search. And so it feels to me like we would be giving ourselves more of an advantage to be really thoughtful and inclusive and um, to board member Vandermeulen's point, like making sure we've got the translation, we have the sign language interpreters, like, like we have all of that set up and use this summer to do more of that logistical planning and really um, start a very inclusive community engagement process um, in the fall. And I do think we would <laughs> also hopefully find ourselves in a position where we are able to attract um, and recruit more individuals who would be better positioned um, to come into a pool, uh, knowing that they would make a transition later um, in, in the school year, rather than trying to think about how they would maybe reverse <laughs> um, movement in, in something they've already committed to, to start this school year. And then the, the last thing um, that, I, that I heard from all of you that I'm also in agreement with is I do feel like um, because we've selected an interim superintendent, Lisa Kistad, who I think is, is well poised to um, kind of stay through us, to stay with the district through next school year. She knows our district well. Um, and I think that she'll be able to like provide the stability that we need. Um, I, to me, I feel like the second timeline, um, I think will create more of an advantage for us to have a really high quality um, search process. So I'm, I'm hearing that six of us, it sounds like are, are more in favor of a longer timeline. One board member would like us to, to move more expediency. I'm willing to reconsider. Okay, so um, board, member, board member Vandermeulen, is there anything that you want to ask Monica about or what would help you get to an okay place with the, the second timeline? Uh, one, two things. One, transparency, transparency, transparency. Yes, I know it said it three times, but I like how it sounds. And uh, number two, um, an explanation to the community groups, because this caused an issue during the uh, failed search that we read. We welcome all input, but the board is making the final decision, and that caused a lot of confusion, mm -hmm. if some of us can recall that. And so I just think that needs to be expressed. And, and one of your her opening around why you thought we should go with a faster timeline, you, you mentioned that people are wondering or questioning yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. And so I guess... That leads me to a point that Monica, you had brought up during your interview with us, which is you will be looking for the district communications department to get a website up or just a variety of ways yes. that we can keep people informed of our progress um, and what we're doing next. And so if we go with the second option, which it sounds like we're in agreement to do, um, do you have a recommendation of when we would start communicating more broadly about what this expected timeline would look like and what community members and staff and families can expect from us? 
Yes, I think we should begin meeting immediately with your communications team, with your family community engagement teams um, to discuss the best channels for communicating with your parents, with your community, with your staff. Uh, I think you can communicate tomorrow that how you're thinking about your timeline at least, and also what some of those um, foundational principles are, the reasoning for having a, a longer timeline. Um, yes, we should absolutely have a board, uh, um, sorry, a website that's updated frequently, um, you know, and we can discuss with the communi communications team if there are other ways in which um, people are accustomed to getting information that we can push out. So everyone's not supposed to go find the website to see what's going on. Uh, so we can talk about that um, with a longer timeline. You might have a monthly coffee hour or monthly kind of thing. Um, you know, so we can talk through that uh, for sure. But I, I would share your adjusted timeline immediately. And then let's work to get the website up and running um, so that we can start um, adding things there as we go through the summer. The other thing too that I just want to say about board, mem board member Vandermulen's comment that really resonated with me, the fatigue is real. And so with the longer process, we do have to pace ourselves through it so that when we get to March, we're not feeling like I have nothing left. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just want to name that's a very legitimate point that we need to just plan for. Um, so with the liaisons, initially we were saying maybe we're meeting weekly. We might still do that for the next couple of weeks, but let's stretch that out to maybe every couple of weeks in the summer. Maybe we have one gathering with the board each month and we think about what it is that we're covering with them uh, and then pick up the pace when we're back at the heart of the, the big search window. So I do think fatigue is a common thing and with a longer time frame. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, I just thought, oh, board member I just thought of one thing really quick, but we can still get the uh, document website up that we can share with everyone, right? Yeah, and I I love what the board president was saying about um, really spending the summer to plan well. This is the one part of our searches we're always like really rushing with because four weeks it sounds like a long time. It's really <laughs> not you know, to be able to plan these things out. So um, I love, I think it, I think what we end up, uh, the ability that we have to truly plan well for what those gatherings look like in the fall, it's, it's exciting to us to be able to work and really plan everything out. That said, we should begin conversations like this week um, to start putting those pieces in place. <laughs> yes. All right. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Perfect. So can we add like um, once a month, just where we're at in the process mm -hmm. at board meetings? Is that possible, Chair? Yeah, we can um, figure that cadence out. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Great. So wanted to give you all just a little more insight into the ways in which the board engages in this process. We will want to um, engage with board members in one-on-one -on -one conversations to hear, learn a little bit more about your path to your board seat, um, your top priorities and goals for the district, your thoughts on what's important for us to get right in this search process. So um, that's a, an immediate next step for us. Um, these activities might be a little out of order with our new timeline, but um, we also want to have all of our community <laughs> gatherings. We would expect to have a survey that goes out to the community, and we absolutely will expect to come back to a public board meeting to share the results of, of what we've heard from the community. Um, we will want to bring together the board for anti-bias training and also to confirm the steps of screening, the screening and selection process. We will work with the board to design your interview questions and activities. 
um, again, to mitigate bias, to ensure alignment with your competencies. We'll work with you to prepare for your interviews. Um, and uh, if there's anyone that's participating outside of the board at any stage of the process, we'll work together on that. Um, as a board, you'll debrief your candidates, select your semifinalists or finalists, and you'll also work to confirm anyone who's engaging in interview panels. You'll be part of the finalist interviews for sure, and then you'll be debriefing and selecting the candidates. So I'm laying all this out because typically uh, in a normal process, each of these activities tend to happen about every two weeks. Um, because this is gonna be um, a longer process, um, I want you to know what these activities are and know that we'll now work with your liaison <laughs> um, to figure out um, when are the right meetings that are already scheduled or that need to be scheduled and how best to engage you in, in all of these different steps in the process. Okay. Um, any questions about the activities? before I talk. And also, I wasn't sure what our schedule was for this evening. Board President, do we still have more time? Yes. Okay. Um, how much more time do you think you need, Monica? No more than 20 minutes, if we had it. Okay. No more than All that. right, that sounds good. Okay, okay, great. We got the most important thing done. So, but um, mm -hmm. while I have you, if we could talk about community engagement, that's the next big thing that we I'd love to discuss. So any questions or just around the way we're laying out these activities here? I do have one question. <laughs> um, and maybe you're gonna get to this during the community engagement section. I, I heard you mention that um, there'll be a survey that goes out to the community. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, there doesn't have to be a survey. But typically, in addition to community gathering, in addition to the in-person types of activities, we like to, there to be an electronic way that people can also participate and participate anonymously if they want. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, remember, I, remember Castro? Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering if we, um, if beyond this meeting, the, the board will have input on uh, <laughs> community engagement. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about that next, but we'll definitely be coming back to this and will probably be the main focus of uh, the work that Alma is planning with the with the board <laughs> over the course of the summer. Um, so this will be mo you. mostly an opening conversation this evening. Yeah. Great. All right. Okay. Um, so let's talk about community input and how it supports the process. And first, and you all will get sick of hearing me say this, but Alma's fundamental belief and core value is that the people with the most at stake in any decision shouldn't just have the chance to provide feedback or provide input. They should really be driving the process. They should have a seat at the table, maybe um, to board member Vandermulen's, um, Vandermulen's point, they're not making the decision. The final decision always rests with the board, but they should be informing the board as to what's really important to the community. What are the key strengths uh, that need to be protected and sustained? What are the real opportunities for positive change that community wants to see? And what do they wanna see in your next leader? So how we think about community voice in our process to us, it just looks different than it does in a more traditional search. Um, we see community voice informing and helping us to create the role description. And we know we've hit the mark when community, community members can say, I can tell by the way the profile was built that the things that I shared were really taken into consideration. I see my voice ref reflected there. Um, we also use community voice to really help inform the competencies required for the role. We hope that we create safe spaces where community members can share with us their lived experience. Um, and their lived experiences create 
powerful stories that for us help inform how we think about the different screening activities and screening questions that we should be asking. We may engage community and finalist interviews. Um, we think that's really important, uh, an important consideration. Um, and uh, when community members are part of the finalist interview uh, process, then their input and feedback is reviewed with the board to inform their final decision making. Um, so you were asking board president about surveys. So I wanna share the three different ways in which we tend to engage um, with the community. The first is around, we call them community gatherings. This is probably the closest to what people would describe as a town hall, but for Alma it looks completely different. Um, our goal is to engage in conversations with your community. So we would wanna have several community gatherings um, um, provided most likely based on this conversation in the early fall. We bring everyone together. We explain what's happening with our process and how their voice is being incorporated into the process. And then we engage in small group discussions that are facilitated by Alma team members. And in those small group discussions, they're intimate conversations with smaller groups uh, to really allow for deeper discussion. Um, in addition to that, we may have one-on-one -on -one interviews with some key stakeholders, key leaders in the district, key community partners, and other focus group conversations with different stakeholder groups. These may include teacher groups, student groups, your associations, your principals, your school-based staff, your partners. They may include, for example, uh, new newcomers to the country, new immigrant uh, community members. You've mentioned the Hmong community. Um, we might have special outreach and have conversations with specific communities um, so that they can speak to us just from their perspective and not try to share time with broader community groups. Um, so the focus groups end up being very important part uh, of our process. And then finally, we do do a staff or community survey. Uh, I think it was board member, member Vander Mullen who shared with us, there's a lot of fatigue around mm -hmm. surveys. So to the extent there are surveys that have already been delivered that have some of the things we might be looking for, we wanna build on what's already known. However, we do wanna have open avenues where people can communicate um, their hopes and expectations uh, and and have the ability to do that uh, anonymously. So we can discuss about what people are going to be most open to and what's going to feel like not duplicative. Um, uh, but we, we would like to have some sort of opportunity for that kind of engagement as well. Let me let me just pause there to get your reactions and questions on the different activities for community input. Um, I'm not sure which hand went up first. Okay. Board member Mosner felt them, and then board member Pearson. Um, a thing that I'm wondering about, and and maybe it's too dreamy, um, but I'm thinking about um, in your experience, Monica. Do you ever see that the outreach and community input um, process can Kind of have longevity, you, you know, like we hired your firm, we're going to do this process, we're going to bring members of our communities together to talk about this. Um, and do you ever see that um, stick around or like be sort of like, a, I don't know how to describe, like a, a place that, that, do you see, do you ever see districts grow from that, not just towards getting a superintendent, but towards having a more robust and more thoughtful community engagement process generally? Yeah, here's what, I, here's what I'll say about that. Um, um, what I've experienced uh, in a few really important ways is that because we're really trying to get out to the community and um, 
it opens up all sorts of opportunities, especially with the amount of time that we have to go out to our community leaders and say, how best can we make this work for your community? Um, so there may be a channel, there may be ways in which maybe the district as an always engaged community that gets discovered in this process that then can be utilized for the future. So that is for certain. The other thing that I would say that I've heard from superintendents we've placed is that the information is so comprehensive that it proves very helpful to the superintendent's entry into the organization. And so they're able to utilize that information. Of course, any strong superintendent is gonna come in and do a ton of listening when they first get there. But to have that insight uh, from the start, uh, our, our superintendent hires will say, this information was incredibly valuable to them and gets utilized in informing their priorities. The third thing that happens, and I'm actually going to be visiting Cincinnati Public Schools next week, which is a district where we placed a leader a year, almost a year ago, uh, 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 recently, um, early May. Um, they're actually having the ALMA team come back. This is not an expectation, but just to share, the community engagement was so beneficial in the search process that now that the board is doing their strategic goal setting with their new superintendent, they would like the ALMA team to come back and sit down with the same community to talk about the mission and vision and future like forecasting for the district aligned with the strategic plan that the superintendent is building. And so what, what I'm connecting to your question is that the community engagement is not only like potentially providing new approaches to community engagement for the district, but it's also providing information that the board can then utilize and reconnect with when you're continuing your goal setting later down the line. Thank you. Board member Pearson and then board member Muldrow. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, yeah, so I think my reaction to this is great. I think, um, I'm definitely a person that values community input at every level, um, ensuring, you know, like our youth and our students are part of it, our teachers are part of this, and that we are focusing on these one-on-one -on -one interviews. I guess, I, Monica, you mentioned leaders of certain communities um, and uh, having like one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, I think when we, typically use leaders in Madison, um, it is very varied in how some of those leaders approach community. Um, and I, I'm saying that just because I think there is a, a value in also ensuring that it's not just only the leaders in certain communities, but that we're, we're passing a wider net and getting even folks that we may not consider um, leaders per se, or are the most visible people, um, but really trying to ensure that those that are not the most visible people are also included in this process. And I know that sometimes it can be a lot harder to get to those people, um, but I, I definitely have confidence um, in the work that I've um, witnessed in other uh, districts um, in doing some of like uh, falling around on references and such. So um, that's what I would say about that. Um, I think this is great. Uh, and I'm excited that we are choosing the longer timeline so that we could really dig deeper. Um, and thank you, Blair, for bringing in the longevity piece because that was something that I was wondering about. We can definitely uh, utilize information that we're doing. And building upon that uh, so that we're not coming back you know, a year or two later and doing the same kind of work um, not necessarily specifically for a search. Let's hope we have a superintendent that stays longer than that time frame. Um, but really of how the community is being engaged in different areas within our district. Um, and then also I like the fact of hearing that there is a possibility 
um, of finding ways to constantly engage the community that isn't punitive and just data collection, um, but really trying to um, build the relationship with community as well. Um, and so that it's an ongoing flow of information um, that we're not just always taking information and then doing what we will with it. Um, so I appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to, uh, just to, just as in one response and something that's resonating with me in what you said is that um, we're really going to be working in partnership with you because we know that as elected board members, you know your constituency really well. Um, and we know that your staff, uh, you know, are also connected to the community. And so we we want to do that brainstorming and have the time to really think through what well, who are the people i love how you said the people who not just the most visible um but also the people who might be harder to reach or 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 um uh or that may have been excluded in the past for whatever reason and that takes some real deep kind of thinking with you all and then some good hard work um, to to make sure that everybody is aware, knows about these opportunities and that we get people um, to participate. So I'm looking forward to that. And, um, you know, just looking forward to that. It really is a little bit of an exploration process. It's your collective minds and what each of you know. Um, but it's also, you know, what, you know, it's also thinking in new and different ways about how to get out to different communities. So um, I would say something you all can start doing now, just in your, you know, I know you all have a lot of spare time, <laughs> um, but to be able to start thinking about, well, who are some of those people that we definitely want to engage? Um, start just making notes of them because at some point we'll come back and, and we'll ask for your recommendations and how you think are the best ways to engage with people. So thank you for that board member, Pearson. Board member Muldrow. Thank you, board president Nichols. So I really appreciate you kind of outlining these tools and strategies for engagement with the community. I want to acknowledge in a similar vein to board member Pearson that we're a multi-generational district that serves literally over 25,000 children and families um, and employs, you know, over 7,000 people. And so I think there has to be a balance between who individual board members know, myself included, and what it means to have this process be truly representative. And one of the things that really um, stands out to me when I think about our last process is how our students were engaged. Our students asked really good questions. If you're a candidate and you're out there watching, our students wanted to know from every single person what their analysis around consent was. That was one of the questions. Um, what are you bringing to the table as a leader in this arena? And what are you thinking? That was our high school students. And that's who we emphasized. How are we going to develop mentally uh, in developmentally appropriate ways, work with our student population so that they feel like they're engaged in this process. This is their school district. This is their leader. Um, the other thing I want to say specifically is I'm looking at these three different things, community gatherings, interviews and focus groups, and uh, staff and community survey. And I'm thinking, which groups get what? Because if I say, oh, well, as a member of the LGBTQ community, there was an interview and a focus group that I went to, and it was amazing. And then I say, and also because I'm a Black woman, I was invited to this community gathering. Um, how are my different identities going to show up in this? So my first question, how are we going to make sure kids have access to this process and that it's appropriate and allows for them to feel an ownership of this as their community? Um, and then the other thing is, who gets what? Who, who gets engaged how? And how do we determine that? I love I love it. I had to write down what you said because it gave me goosebumps. It is your student school district and it's their next leader. And they are absolutely going to be the smartest ones with the toughest questions. There's no doubt about it. And the students, every single time, they're just so clear about what they want in their learning experience. I mean, it's just just 
just follow what they say they want. And uh, we'd have amazing school systems <laughs> everywhere. So I'm 100% with you on school and student engagement. And um, I'm excited to talk about the ways to engage students. Um, what I will say is that some things have been easier, some things have been more challenging. They're just logistical issues about how and when you get students to together. Um, that we kind of have to work through. Sometimes they're, they're already groups created, like there's student advisory councils that are already created that we can tap right into or student groups that are already organized. But how we create openings for all students is something we really want to think about. Um, and that's super exciting to us. So we we're, we're, um, just completed a search in Cleveland, Ohio. We got to meet with 400 students and have these like really engaged conversations about what they wanted for their school, for their experience, um, for their next leader. And it was just wonderful. We've never had that kind of access to students before. Um, but they they already had kind of a setup that we could tap into. So for us to think about, so there could be really exciting ways. You asked about, uh, I think a couple of things, we wanna make sure we're getting all the students, not just like your high performers. Um, so let's think about that. Yeah. And the other thing that um, I want to say is um, that um, on the students is, yes, that we we want to think about what is development, developmentally appropriate, but I actually think every age group will have insights. And so to the extent we can think not just around your high school students, but your middle schoolers, your your earlier grades, I, I'd be really interested in that. All right, then <laughs> you asked what activities are available to whom? And what we hope is that all activities are available to everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. The community gatherings, everybody's welcome and everybody can join. The interviews and focus groups are more targeted by specific role and person, by specific role. Um, but we're hoping every person can find themselves in at least one of those groupings. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I swallowed down the wrong tube. And then um, the surveys are also available to everybody. So mm -hmm. um, we hope all of these are available to everybody. And then that there are things that go on beyond. I mean, in, there have been districts where we just have an email, like, you know, superintendent search at, and hey, anytime you want to just send us a note and tell us what you're thinking, like we we welcome that. So we can decide if there are other things beyond the survey. Um, but yes, and I know, I know. Just checking on time, board president. Um, but I'm <laughs> comfortable to stay on. I just want to be sensitive to that. Okay, I um, thank you for that, Monica. We we will. Um, Hopefully you don't have too much more, but I do see board member Castro and then I, I have something I'd also like to ask. And I think uh, board member Bander Mullen has um, another very brief, question. very brief question. Yeah, and I think this is a good pausing point in the slides. I mean, obviously there were more in the presentation, but I think we're having the conversation we need to have. So, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, my uh, my only comments are to um, emphasize, um, as other board members have said, that one, um, be transparent in this, and two, um, that this is the board's decision throughout the community process. Um, and so with this is, I think, um, an opportunity to also um, kind of inform the community on superintendent roles, board roles, and you know, throughout this process, develop a job description for the superintendent that leads into the evaluation. Oh, that's it. Thank you, Board Member Castro. Um, the one thing that I wanted to ask about is, um, although this may be a new search, the community is got stored wisdom, right? Um, some stored hurts, <laughs> some stored frustrations and some stored hopes. And what I would imagine is that as you're starting a community gathering process or even focus groups that although your questions may very much be about what you want your next superintendent um, to be and who they will be and bring into the 
bring into the district, I do think there are folks who are going to have um, some disappointments, some stress and some frustration, um, perhaps, that they may want to articulate. And that, and that, that could be directed at us as board members. It could be directed at the, you know, just the direction that, of the district. It could be a variety of things. And so my wondering is, as you begin to hold space for folks, how do you kind of validate and affirm that folks have had a variety of experiences that are real and that there is hope and opportunity in naming um, what we want to be different or, you know, with, with a new superintendent? So I don't know if you've encountered this as you've done other community engagement um, with other searches, but I, I'm imagining that some of that will arrive, will come up um, in this process. So just wondering how you tease that out. Yeah, so the truth of the matter is we know we're doing our jobs well when we get to all of the above, right? When we have this arc in this conversation and people start opening up and sharing their frustrations, their, their um, hurts, the things that have occurred, and it becomes a little bit cathartic for people. And we want that. We want to receive all of it uh, because it's all helping to inform where the district goes from here. Um, so, you know, um, this can be very beneficial. Um, it allow it pro provides a place where people can process some of those things and then actually see what the board does with that information, that it wasn't just going into a black hole. Um, so it's really important for us that we provide an authentic um, report back on what are the things that are happening with that safety and anonymity that people have and want, if they want it, right, um, to be able to, to have those conversations with us. And that's why I said this community gathering piece is different because it's not about the one person who gets the microphone and stands up and talks. Right. It's about having these conversations where people can really tell us what's on their mind. Um, and that's, uh, you know, and then you get to learn from that and choose your next leader with that in, in mind. And so we hope it, it does create strong some some healing, a little bit of healing. And also, um, as you are all saying, like we want to find your next leader for the long run. And the better we can be at identifying what your community is really wanting for the future, but you can't get to that without them sharing why they feel that way, which is sometimes informed by the past, the better job we can do finding, you know, just the right next person for you who's ready for, for everything your community brings, the positives, the challenges, the opportunities, the hurts, the wisdoms, the frustrations, the hopes, all of it, right? Your next leader is going to know what that is and be like, yes, this is right for me. I'm your right person. And here's why. Um, so, yes. Yes, to everything you said. <laughs> Thank you so much. My, my brief thing on community engagement is uh, this. When we did the board listening sessions, they, three of them were wonderful. And the one in Memorial, you had to climb up a set of stairs to be able to get to the main speaking area or have a pass to use the elevator. Can we please pick a place that's 100% accessible? That's my only complaint because that was hard for even me to get up. Yeah, I would really love to have the opportunity, um, maybe with, the, with your um, diverse learner staff or special education experts, um, to just think about what are the accommodations that are important for us to provide, to have that inform the, the facilities that we utilize, but also what tools we can have um, at, at our meetings. And we might decide to have a focus group um, that's for members of the community by ability. And I'm so I'm just very open to what those possibilities might be. Um, and with a little bit of time over the summer, I think we could plan some really wonderful um, events and, and activities where people can bring their full selves. Um, I, I don't know if you remember this, board member Vandermeulen, but my 
eldest son has high functioning autism. Yes, I remember having that. And how he would engage. And first of all, he is incredibly smart and has very good insights and will be very direct in what he sees. Yes, he will. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and and I, I don't know that a community gathering would be the right place for him, you know, so maybe yeah. we could think a little bit more about even the autistic community or um, other communities. Um, I would love to hear what people have to say in a space where they can engage and aren't distracted by a lot of noise, activity and all sorts of things. Absolutely. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I would love to discuss that with you. Perfect. Let's, we're going to make a plan for that. Absolutely. All right. Monica, do you think, um, do you have more that we should cover tonight or do you feel like we've. We're at a good stopping point. I honestly don't remember which slides are next. I'll just rush through that, run through them quickly. Um, Let's see. Yeah, that's a lot of words, but this is like, these are the steps for community engagement. We'll have a lot more time to go through that. And we've already talked about some of the pitfalls and the things that, so we've discussed the things we want to be aware of and working towards. You're all asking exactly the right questions there. As we begin our planning stages, these are the kinds of things we're going to come back and discuss. You know, who are those stakeholder groups? Um, We want to hear that from you. How will we know that we have successfully engaged the community? Are there any community engagement opportunities already occurring? that we can either attend or become a part of. Um, So we've got lots of time to think about this, but um, you were all asking the question about how to update the community throughout the process. We'll start working on that. And um, who is best positioned to support communications? I think we've already begun discussing that with your liaisons and um, can come back and and share what we're thinking there. So that's it. you know, uh, right now we'll be working with the board liaisons to confirm a, a regular cadence of meetings with them. And they they will likely come back to you with some ideas about when the Alma team can come back and meet with the board um, next. But I just thank you so much for this time and this conversation. I, I'm totally in love with this district <laughs> and this board, and I'm excited uh, to move forward. Um, yeah, really excited about this. I think it's going to be great. Well, we so appreciate you um, being able to come tonight and really walk us through the process and, and to do so obviously in a public meeting so that we are helping to provide that transparency. And I just want to extend um, heartfelt thanks also to my fellow board colleagues on us um, really being thoughtful um, about arriving to consensus about taking the the slightly slower approach, um, but one that we think is going to bring us uh, a really high quality candidate pool and a very inclusive, accessible, transparent community engagement process. So um, with that, I'll take a motion so moved. to adjourn. <laughs> Second by Maya. All right, all those um, in favor of adjourning. I thank you. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.